Welcome back to Google Developers Live. You're on the Chrome channel. Uh, here for the final, the fifth and final episode of the Udacity CS256 Office Hours, the mobile web development course. It's been a blast uh, for the last five mm -hmm. or four times yeah. and, and for our yeah. final episode here. Yeah. Some um, of us weren't here for the entire one. That's <laughs> right. Hey, <laughs> that, was your, that was your trip. It was great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming back to answer the final yeah. questions. <laughs> so I'm here with uh, Sean Bennett, course architect mm -hmm. at Udacity, Chris Wilson, course instructor and works for Google, and myself, Peter Lubbers. Um, all right, so we've got a couple questions. If you have questions, if you're watching live, <coughs> you can still ask additional questions. You can also vote for questions. Um, you do that by going to developers.google.com slash live, and then you find the uh, on-air uh, episode that's airing right now, and then you go to that page, and at the bottom there's a moderator to ask questions. So let's dive right in mm -hmm. with the first question from Las Vegas by Samurawi. Um, are we going to cover the differences between feature detection versus browser detection using the user agent? Um, and what would be the best way to accomplish that? So <laughs> who wants to take that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, try to avoid using user agent if you can. Right. It's yeah, not always I possible. Mean, but the, the, my, <laughs> my history in uh, browsers leads me to believe it's a really bad thing to, yeah. to link to specific browsers, just because, especially in mobile, there mm. are so many different right. user agents. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of user agents that you can get. Um, so strong, strong recommendation. Use feature detection. Modernizer's awesome. Yep. There are other libraries, too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd, I'd just say go down that path. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. way easier, way less painful. Um, and they work pretty well at this point. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's more future proof, right? If you yeah. use feature yeah. detection, for those that don't know what that is, it's basically checking <coughs> whether the browser supports a particular feature. Right. And then you can fall back if it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But if you use a user agent, I mean, there's really no way of telling. Yeah. Sometimes user agent strings are even passed with the wrong. Yeah. I mean, a great right example string, is right. what the latest version of IE changed their user agent. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Did they remove MSIE, I believe, did, and, I think, yes. and just mm -hmm. kept Titan right. instead? So yeah, um, if you did that, then you wouldn't detect that IE 11. And, <laughs> and the reason for that, by the way, I'm sure, is yeah. that they had to remove the MSIE because so many pages out there had hard-coded mm -hmm. in a browser detection string yeah. that said, if MSIE is somewhere in the user agent, then do some horky old thing mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is yeah. no longer e even remotely appropriate for right. modern IE. Yeah. But there was no other way for them to get around that. Mm -hmm. If those same pages had used feature detection instead, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have this problem. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very hard to do it right. Yeah, the user agent yeah. is just, just yeah. incredibly hard. The, right, right. Yeah. There, there's a great, uh, great article about um, user agent detection and um, the history of user agent that mm -hmm. I'll, I'll try and remember to post as a response to this. That's hilarious. Yeah. Like, it, in the beginning, there was the user agent, and it's it's yeah. utterly hilarious. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I'll try to remember to post that. <laughs> cool. So another question from Samurawi. Um, are we going to cover advantages and disadvantages of using libraries like jQuery Mobile and other capabilities like Canvas, WebGL, WebSocket? So for the latter part, some of those APIs didn't make a lot of sense in mm -hmm. the conference app, the, the apps that we were building. Mm -hmm. You can actually learn a lot about Canvas in CS255. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. It's Focus on games, but a mm -hmm. lot of those concepts will apply. Yep. WebGL, I, I believe you yeah, guys have got a, course. we've got a 3D graphics course right. that's taught in WebGL. Right. Um, it actually uses 3JS, um, so okay. it hides yep. some of the abstractions. A lot of people um, do not, right? But yeah, it's um, if you want to learn more about that, that's great. WebSockets for mobile, I mean, that's basically like fine. You yep. can use and that. We anywhere. actually discussed it yeah. in detail mm -hmm. in last week's episode. Yeah. Um, Chris was on the beach, of course, but mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the dive boat. <laughs> on the dive boat. Was. <laughs> I was on the beach. I was on the dive boat. Um, but, but as far as I know, a yeah. lot of these, um, a lot of those technologies are, are supported reasonably well in various mobile browsers. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think <coughs> you know Canvas, WebGL, WebSockets. These are really mm -hmm. go learn about how to use those features and mm -hmm. you learn about how to yeah to use them on mobile. Mm -hmm. But mean, for the first part yeah, of this yeah, question, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, no, <laughs> <Short answer. laughs> uh, mostly because uh, using libraries like jQuery Mobile, they they are great libraries. We really wanted to teach the fundamentals of mm -hmm. how mobile is different, like mm -hmm. how 
what, what we even mean when we say develop mobile first. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those, you may not end up looking at the, you know, the, the exact technical details of the, the lessons that we cover in this later on, but you need to understand why they're there and what mm -hmm. they're doing for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that was what we were really trying to get at. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, perfect. All right, so next question from Dakar, from Bakum. Um, how do you think it's possible to build more web applications with high quality and awesome design? Because sometimes it's a real programming. Uh, real problem. Uh, real, real problem, problem sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Comparing to native apps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th I yeah. think this is one of the biggest challenges right, right now, yeah. is that there are a lot of things that are, are not missing, really, but mm -hmm. maybe a little harder to mm -hmm. do. Um, on the mobile web, but a lot of that is because it is this portable platform that goes mm -hmm. across all these different environments and scenarios. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's relatively easy to write a, a tool or, or support developers who are building um, applications that only mm -hmm. run on one form factor of device mm -hmm. or two form yeah. factors of device. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're getting there. I think tools mm -hmm. have come an amazing yeah. distance. Just in, in the, the last, last year. Easily in the last yeah. year, in the last six months, even, yeah. uh, there's <laughs> some pretty cool stuff that's happened. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we are definitely getting there. I think design tools in um, mm -hmm. the, the native, uh, design tools in the mobile web platform particularly are kind of um, an area for improvement yeah. right now. Yeah. But I also think there are some really big names getting into that space mm -hmm. that are going to help yeah. dramatically. The things yeah. that I've seen out of Adobe, for example, I was just gonna over say. the last year mm -hmm. or two, um, Pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Like those, yeah, I right. would have, you know, just been jumping yeah. up and down mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. that. So. And a lot of the stuff they're doing, they're trying to kind of open source some of that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Developer tools too. I mean, oh, yeah. if you've looked at the brackets editor, um, for and that's primarily mm -hmm. focused on web development. So yes. mobile web development yeah. as well is fantastic. Um, so there's a lot of people working on tooling. And, that is and I don't think there's going to be just no. one tool set mm -hmm. either. Um, I remember even way back in the day in the, the late 90s. Uh, at Microsoft, you know, we started supporting the web platform and tools. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing was we had multiple different and wildly different uh, versions of tools. Like we had front page. Mm -hmm. It was really more about like revision control system yep. almost mm -hmm. more than anything. You know, it had a WYSIWYG editor that was okay, um, but certainly not great. But the the revision control and the, the hooking up to the back end was really powerful. Um, mm -hmm. And then we had Visual Interdev, I think it was mm -hmm. called, yeah. um, which was oh, like okay. the developer tool. Yeah. And it was, you know, really it helped you build your JavaScript, but it didn't know anything about HTML. Mm -hmm. or, you know, it didn't yeah. really bring it together. And I think now mm -hmm. we're starting to see the tools that bring all of these pieces together. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, question from Pierre in Stockholm: uh, Any tips for responsive design media query breakpoint values? Uh, some designers argue it's in vain to seek them, but instead to let your specific layout dictate where they are. Where they are, um, Chris, you also let's, mentioned. Let's take that first. Those are, those yeah, are separate. Two questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So they're, break they're both good questions. Yeah. But, uh, Should you use breakpoints? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, yeah. go ahead. I, I mean, yeah. I don't think he's asking whether you should, but like, are there specific oh. values that are a good oh, starting points? Right? Yes. Um, I think that wholly depends on the kind of app you're building. Yeah. If you're building something fairly, you know, traditional or typical, or some, then there are good, you know, good ideas to have. But mm -hmm. I think the the point that some designers argue that you know you really should make these decisions in the context of whatever you're building is a really good one. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's it's partly your layout and where it naturally makes sense to start breaking things. Mm -hmm. um, it can also be what devices you think are most appropriate mm -hmm. to support. Um, although it was interesting because uh, we had a, a talk given by Luke Rablewski mm -hmm. um, a right. couple weeks ago in, in for our, our Chrome Developer Relations team, and uh, Luke had this diagram where he showed like all of the screen sizes mm -hmm. um, of a, a wide variety of, of mobile devices. And it was interesting because you didn't see a lot of clustering. Like mm -hmm. I would have expected more clustering around mm -hmm. a mobile phone um, mm -hmm. size and a tablet size and you know, desktop is kind of all over the board. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't as much as you would think. There was so much bleed over between the two because there are so many devices out. And mm -hmm. he even, uh, he showed um, the, well, what if you just limited it to one manufacturer? 
and chose like Samsung, I think. <laughs> and it was still right. like, you know, 20 <laughs> devices because they have a huge range. And right. I think that's mm -hmm. the interesting thing is there are so many different devices, it's harder to, to hook with that. Mm -hmm. And it's really better to say, you know, this is, well, this is what you're gonna get when you're on a, a, a device like a mobile phone because this is how my layout works mm -hmm. best on it. Yeah. And think about how it's gonna work best when you move up to the next device. Maybe it just scales up, maybe it, mm -hmm. then you have room for a little mm -hmm. column next to it and that's really what you want. Yep. You wanna put yep. your toolbar on the side or things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So second part of the question, uh, Chris, right. you mentioned screen proportions, 2X, 3X. How do you uh, use that? I did. Um, there is a min and max device pixel ratio and a min resolution, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, min and max resolution too, I think. And as media query uh, parameters, I forget what the, the word for the, the inputs to them are, mm -hmm. um, for media query rules. And I think that you could just use those to say, you know, if you're a minimum device resolution of this, then you know, use this high resolution image, or mm -hmm. if you're not, don't. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I will say is make sure to capture both of those, the, the min and the max, mm -hmm. so that you don't have a high resolution device download both images. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And obviously always run in the, the profiler mm -hmm. and see what your downloads are. Okay. So from Stockholm, we jump to Norway. Keeping it in Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What's the best scenario uh, for mobile web apps if you want to use MongoDB, NoSQL DB, not CouchDB? Uh, what are some good libraries that will take care of dirty, updated, missing, local cache hits, etc.? Um, <laughs> control flow related. So <laughs> <laughs> we had a, we had an interesting conversation yeah. about this one before yeah. the show because yeah. we were looking through the questions and. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a tough one, and I think, uh, Sean, you made a comment that I thought was really appropriate, that you know, I think maybe people are kind of holding their breath yeah. mm -hmm. building those libraries, mm -hmm. um, partly because uh, we're waiting for a service worker to come around. Um, for those of you who don't know, yeah. service worker is a, a way of building mm -hmm. very rich offline abilities by essentially kind of taking over what the request system does mm -hmm. in the web platform. So when your application says, hey, I want this file, it doesn't just use this local cache or hit the network, um, your own code can figure out what to do mm -hmm. uh, intelligently. And th that's one side of the coin. Yeah. And the other side of the coin, mm -hmm. frankly, is IndexedDB. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd love to say it's deployed on every mobile device <laughs> that you might possibly be interested mm -hmm. in. Sadly, it's that's not yeah, yet. the case. Um, but mm -hmm. it is getting there. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, you know, doing a local cache database, a locally cached database system is mm -hmm. a very hard problem, yeah. and it really depends on the scale, um, your your exact application. Mm -hmm. I, I was telling these guys about um, when I was at Microsoft. Uh, I actually signed up for the, the the internal dog food of Exchange very early, like in the, the you know mid '90s. Um, and it took them a long time to get it perfectly right, like to get it to work super well in offline, because it was a backend database and a local cache, mm -hmm. and you want it to work that way. You want to step onto a plane with no Wi-Fi and have all of your email there mm -hmm. for you in that, that mm -hmm. scenario. But you also want to get you know delivery of mail mm -hmm. instantly, yep. <laughs> ideally, yeah, yep. and that yeah. was a, a tough problem. And it's also a different system that you would want to use for that than, yeah. uh, you know, the, Database systems are not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of part of the push to use IndexedDB, was giving a low level, just the indexed key storage system. Mm -hmm. And then you can layer on SQL or whatever mm -hmm. variant of, mm -hmm. of query language you want. So the short answer is I don't think there's a great library here. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. think there's a, a just go use this library and it will all work out. Um, I think in the future you'll probably see some come up as Service Worker mm -hmm. comes mm -hmm. out and as IndexedDB is deployed everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still going to be a little bit customized depending on your application. You're going to have to do some work there. Yeah. Yep. All right. So another question. Um, I would like to hear your analysis and comparison of different uh, HTML5 to native tools like PhoneGap, Ionic, Titanium, mm -hmm. and what about hybrid apps and missing mobile support? Um, on different platforms, I guess, for certain features. Um, so any thoughts? I, 
The only one I've mm -hmm. used is the phone gap. Yeah, um, that's the primary one I've used. Yeah. Um, it's really easy to use. Um, right. And right, it's. Right. Um, I haven't used ionic or titanium. I right. don't know. If so I I've looked at them, but I haven't actually right. built with them. So. Mm -hmm. so I guess we can't give you a fair comparison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. So they're awful. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just because we haven't used them. Yeah. <laughs> no. So uh, maybe look online. Maybe we can find dig up some. Uh, comparisons, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm sure they all have their yeah, great features. Yeah, I think features. last, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we had a similar question, and I yep. looked up and found the comparison of HTML5 embeddings, mm -hmm. um, app systems, and I think that th there's also the whole second part of this question, which I think is around what about things that aren't in yep. the mobile web platform, that mm -hmm. are in the native app platforms. Mm -hmm. um, right, right, right. I mean, I if there are things there that you desperately need, probably kind of out of luck, mm -hmm. unless yeah. you can get them added into the, the frameworks. One of the big challenges for me has always been um, the, the security of the web platform mm -hmm. is a very different beast than the native platforms. And it probably shouldn't be, really, because so many times I, I, you know, I've, I have to set up a new phone because my phone died on me again yesterday. Um, and as I was reinstalling some of the applications, some of the native apps that I used, I realized like you know some of them ask for really wild yeah. permissions, right, exactly. and you don't really even notice. You're mm -hmm. like, sure, this yeah. game needs to read all of my contacts. It's like, yeah. Well, maybe it doesn't actually. Yeah. <laughs> and the web, by default, of course, tries to protect you from all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also seeing as Chrome is is disabling the NP API plugin system by default, um, that it, we're just starting to do that. And this causes a bunch of scenarios mm -hmm. to kind of come out of the woodwork because a bunch of people used this for yep. really weird things mm -hmm. with custom mm -hmm. plugins. I used it for my web MIDI shim, actually. Oh, so yeah, that yeah. kind of okay. dies <laughs> <laughs> if you don't re-enable it. Um, but yeah. all of those pieces together, you know, they kind of help us figure out what's missing from yep. the platform. Yep. And I will say, a tremendous number of those things have gone into the mobile web platform. Yeah. I mean, just looking mm -hmm. at the device access uh, lesson, you get a feel for, wow, you do have access to a lot of neat stuff. Yep. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's pretty yeah. pretty exciting. And I think that'll grow over time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean <laughs> that will grow. I think we'll see more and more of a kind of uh, expandable mobile web mm -hmm. um, permission system. Mm -hmm. Like, at some point, you have to be able to not hit allow every time you yeah. know, my audio recorder web page wants mm -hmm. access to the microphone, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so we have another question from Craig in Maine. Okay. Um, maybe something for you, Sean. Can you talk a little bit about coding to promote unit testability and give an example of what a unit testable JavaScript function would look like? <laughs> OK. Um, so the, the thing you have to do here is code for testability from the get-go. It is very hard to retrofit for your application. That, in my mind, is probably one of the single. <laughs> that in performance. Yeah, yeah, that in performance. Those, yeah. those two are definitely um, one of the ones. Yeah, it, it's very hard. Well, actually, three. That, performance, and offline. You kind of have to keep those in mind from security. the beginning. Security. <laughs> and security, no. And, yeah. And <laughs> design. <laughs> um, design for all the things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you really have to, th have to be thinking about um, what kind of tests you're going to be writing from the get-go and design your application to actually be able to run those tests. Um, your code has to be modular, fairly you know, small chunks that you can test, unit test one at a time, you know, call one thing, mock it up, and see if it works. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard if your app doesn't do that already to retrofit it. It is. <laughs> and one of the things that I've always found in writing yeah. code that, that helps to promote good unit testability is you have to clearly define exactly what every, mm -hmm. every function is going to do. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, like I get in this trap every once in a while with code that I write with web mm -hmm. audio code because it's really easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, is you have to be careful about causing side effects. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. if you say, well, this is supposed to you know set the frequency of the oscillator, but it doesn't actually also say, oh yes, and it starts it playing or some other yeah. you know side mm -hmm. effect. You can get in weird situations mm -hmm. um, when you call something else and mm -hmm. it doesn't work because. Yeah. It didn't have the side effect right. happening. I mean, mm -hmm. really, all of these are all, all of these concerns are you need to plan your architecture out 
ahead of time. So, yes. And unfortunately, well, the web makes it very easy to not do that right. and kind of you know play around with things and get something up and running, which is fantastic. Yeah. But it doesn't often lead to code that is easily testable or yes. you know where you have all of this documented well and you understand from a broad picture what your architecture is and what it should be. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean really I think the the short version is just be intentional when mm -hmm. you when you code like yeah. be, declare what your intents are for every function, every object, mm -hmm. whatever you're doing. Like this is yeah. what this is supposed to do. Yeah. And it helps other people tremendously. Didn't you supposed to get yeah. new phone? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, and and there are tools you can use to kind of help with this. For example, uh, JS Doc kind of um, forces you. I mean, if you actually JS Doc all of your code, mm -hmm. and then you know um, <clears throat> test and make sure that it does conform to the, your JS Doc, you, it keeps yeah. you thinking about these things, right? Yep. Like, what is passed into here? Am I testing that that's what's passed into here? What's returned? Do I have any side effects? Um, yeah. Good commenting and good documentation helps a lot. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Great. All right, so back to Oslo. How would you wisely split the native mobile HTML and hybrid parts of the mobile app cake? Uh, could you discuss this LinkedIn link okay. here, Venture Beat article? And do you think they would revert with new tools? So I haven't read this uh, article yet. Uh, I can probably comment on it a little bit later. But the new tools strikes yeah. me as something that um, there's an incredible amount of power in, for example, the Chrome Dev tools. Yeah. And well, these and, and this article is from about ten months ago. So okay. Okay. Really, mm -hmm. the you know they're looking at the tool set as it was. A year or more mm -hmm. ago, right? Because right. that yeah. was as they were developing. Yeah. And, and they specifically still. point out performance tooling, which has yes. come just Incredible. a right. huge From way that in that yes. time. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. So I have I haven't read the entire article. Have you? We kind of. Uh, yeah, I think, it, right? I think I I read it actually. I remember reading it when okay. it first mm -hmm. came out right. and uh, reread it again. And I, I think that um, you know it's it. I don't expect everyone to say, oh, we should totally dump native mm -hmm. right now today and just do HTML-based mm -hmm. development, because there are some, some implications there. Mm -hmm. And the tool set, as we've discussed, is still kind of in progress mm -hmm. in some places. Mm -hmm. I think it's come a dramatically long way, and I think it's, it's headed in the right direction, certainly. Looking at the LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn's decision a year or more ago to go back to native after doing, uh, after doing web stuff, I don't think they necessarily made the wrong decision at the mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. because they didn't have all that tool set in front of them. I think that some of the things they say in that article aren't true anymore because of the dev tools. Mm -hmm. I think some of them around design tooling, uh, which they only sort of hinted at, mm -hmm. um, those are still probably yeah. a kind of appropriate. But uh, I do think they probably changed their mind about other things. Mm -hmm. But I will highlight that in the article, um, the LinkedIn person actually did say, you know, we have all of our data in these object storage systems anyways. Like, all our data is in JSON, so mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Like, we can go recast this mm -hmm. and change it over pretty easily and quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you should be doing that. Yeah. Like, you shouldn't be writing, yeah. hard coding <laughs> all of your data into HTML5 anyways. Mm -hmm. It should be a data system that then gets pulled in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, if you're going to be splitting your application across different technologies, that's even more yes. crucially yes. important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and as to the first uh, part of his question, you know, how would you split um, native, mo HTML, and hybrid? I would say that really depends on what you're doing, too. Um, yeah. I mean, if you're taking advantage of something that fundamentally you can't do in, in the mobile web, mm -hmm. then absolutely go native. Yeah. I mean, right. Me personally, if I can do it in um, with web technologies, that's probably the route that I'm going to choose. Just because one code base is so much better <laughs> to maintain in my eyes than multiple code bases. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if I can, if I have that option, I'm going to take it. Um, you don't always. <laughs> yeah. Good point. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, hybrid is really just a way of getting the packaging and, and yeah. delivery semantics mm -hmm. of native. While still building in, in mobile, mm -hmm. yeah, and the, uh, yeah, the store, yeah, right. mm -hmm. and exactly. deployment, right, right. discovery. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So our final question, 
at least for now, mm -hmm. <laughs> from Get your here in, in, now. in yeah. Stockholm, <laughs> <laughs> it's still possible. Um, so thanks for the awesome course and the fabulous staff. Thank you. Uh, is there any reason in the Flexbox demo to prefer the section tag over the div? And by the way, hope the water was warm in Hawaii. It's quite warm. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. Warm for Hawaii in the winter. Well, thanks, say. Pierre. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, there was a good reason for yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I, I mean. I don't think this is specific to the Flexbox demo in any right, way. Right. Um, but in general, if you can use a more semantically specific tag, mm -hmm. you want to do that. Um, but there wasn't any reason to do that no. in the Flexbox demo. No. Um, section or div would work fine um, because we didn't right. have, say, an article and a section and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But right. one of the big one of the initial big pushes with HTML5 was right. actually having semantic content. Exactly. Yes. Um, which right makes things much easier to mm -hmm. read and parse mm -hmm. and figure out um, well, that's really taken what off. you're doing. A yeah. lot of those uh, mm -hmm. tags are now widely used. Mm -hmm. um, I think section. that was one of the earliest things, yeah. and now it's right. basically everywhere. Right. Exactly. Um, right. Yeah, semantic markup, if you can do it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and if it makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think that wraps up the question. So um, we've enjoyed being here for five yeah. weeks in a row. Hopefully, Absolutely. you've <laughs> had some help with, yeah. the, um, with the course. I think we'll probably host another office hours maybe in March or something mm -hmm. in a month. So we can just open that up for questions ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned for some announcements about when and, and how you can an ask questions there. So all of these uh, live sessions are also available in recorded form right after, same URL. And that's at developers.google.com slash live slash chrome. And then you can find all the stuff there. We'll also do a blog post next week on the Udacity mm -hmm. um, website and just kind of recapping the office hours and mm -hmm. making those available. So, well, thanks, Sean, no, Chris. Thank you, thanks, Peter. Peter. Thank you, yeah. Sean. Thanks You're to welcome. all of you. <laughs> thanks to the staff in the GDL studio. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it for, for this time. Yeah. All right, see you soon.